Okay, in order to go the other direction, where I give you a name, like sodium chloride, and you can up, come up with a formula, like NaCl, um, we need to understand a little bit more about what ionic bonding is, and what these charges, these positives and negatives that you saw on the polyatomic ions, what those mean. Um, so, ionic compounds, or ionic bonding to form a compound happens when one element gives up electrons and another element takes those electrons. There's a full transfer of electrons. Electrons themselves are negative, so when something gives up an electron, it's giving up negative charge, that leaves it positive. It started neutral, everything's starting neutral on the periodic table, but if you're going to get rid of an electron, getting rid of negative, you end up with a positive ion. Um, something that accepts those electrons is now getting more negativity, more negative, so it's going to have a negative charge and be a negative ion. Um, there are names for them, in case you hear them anywhere. Positively charged ions are called cations. Negatively charged ions are called anions. I don't need you to know those names, but in case you've heard them before. Um, so again, these have lost electrons. E minus is a shorthand for electron, and these have gained electrons. So when you have those subscripts, um, like in Al2O3, that's telling us how many different atoms had to come together and exchange electrons so that overall we end up with a neutral compound, um, where the same number of electrons that have been lost have been gained. Um, we don't ever just have random electrons not having a place to go when we're talking about ionic compounds. I'll show you a few examples, um, and you'll need your periodic tables handy for this. So, sodium chloride. You probably already know that the answer for this one is going to be NaCl, but let's look at how I get that and why there aren't any subscripts. Start by taking um, the name and coming up just with the symbols on the periodic table. So sodium is not S, right? You go to the periodic table, you find sodium, you'll see that it's Na. Chloride, remember the I'd, we had changed the ending, so really we're looking for chlorine on the periodic table, which is CM. Um, if you go to where you found Na and you go to the very top of that column, handwritten in, you should see a plus one. And for chlorine, if you go to the top of that column, you should see a minus one. So those charges that are written in on your periodic table tell you the charge that those different elements will form when they become an ion. So it turns out sodium plus one, it likes to lose one electron. Chlorine gains one electron. So sodium chloride is actually going to form thanks to sodium losing an electron, chlorine gaining that electron, and now these positive and negative things can join together to be NaCl. Overall, a po positive one and a negative one, we should have no charge. We should be neutral by the time we're done. Um, I only need one of each for those charges to cancel out. Um, some people approach it differently, though. That one might make some intuitive sense. Another way of figuring out how many of each we need to cancel is to do what I call as the crisscross. Okay, so ignoring positive and negative, because we're always going to have one be positive and one be negative, just looking at the numbers of the charges, we can take those numbers and crisscross them into subscripts. So Na should get a subscript of 1, Cl should get a subscript of 1, and 1s as subscripts are implied, so really I don't even need to show them. That's another shortcut way of just getting to our answer. Going through a bunch of examples, um, be willing to pause and go back, but also be willing to just hear me out. Um, it'll make more sense as you see more examples. Um, another example, magnesium sulfide. So magnesium I find on the periodic table, it's in the second column. I go to the top of that column and I see that it's a plus two. Sulfide, make sure you know the difference between sulfide and sulfate. Ides are things that are going to be on the periodic table, just elements, not our polyatomic ions, right? We know sulfate is SO4, this is sulfide, so just talking S, 
and that's a minus 2. Now, let's say you use my crisscross trick, okay? You'd have mg, s, this 2 would crisscross down to the magnesium, and I'll use a different color. This 2 would crisscross down to the sulfur, and we'd have mg2s2. But we'd have to go one step further and reduce it to just mgs. Because mg2s2 is saying, oh, I need two magnesiums and two sulfurs. But I don't. One magnesium and one sulfur, that's the same ratio. You'll see ratios matter a lot in chemistry. That's the same ratio. Magnesium can go ahead and lose two electrons. Sulfur can go ahead and gain those two electrons, cancel out, and be neutral. So anytime the charges are the exact same number, you're going to see no subscripts because they balance out. We only need one of each for that transfer to take place evenly. Uh, however, if I see something like calcium nitride, calcium is in the second column. I look at the top, it has a plus two charge. Nitrogen, nitride is nitrogen, is in the fourth column from the right. If you look at the top, it has a minus three charge. This one's harder to think through, okay? This one's gonna lose two electrons, but this needs to gain three. Okay, so if I have two of those, I can lose four electrons, but this one's also only gaining three. Um, if you have a really mathy brain naturally, it might make sense to you, but if not, crisscrossing works. Calcium, I'm gonna need, again, I'll use different colors, three of my calciums. That's telling me I need three pieces of calcium, like three calcium atoms. And the two crisscrosses down to my nitrogen. Sorry, I should have written the nitrogen already. And I need two nitrogens. So Ca3N2. Okay, a few more examples to iron out some other details. Let's say potassium oxide. Potassium is K, it has a plus one charge. Oxide is oxygen, it has a minus two charge. If I crisscross, I get K, two, O. I don't need to write the one, it would be weird if you did write the one. Um, but this means I have two potassium atoms and one oxygen atom. Um, okay, another one that I'll use, let's do a couple with polyatomics in there. So. Let's do ammonium nitride. Ammonium is my polyatomic ion that is NH4 plus one. So now you know why those charges are written on the polyatomic ions. This NH4 group as a whole needs to lose one electron. Nitride is not nitrate, it's just I'd. So we're talking the element from the periodic table, nitrogen which is a minus three. If I go to crisscross, I'm gonna only need one nitrogen, but I'm going to need three of this NH4 group. And so the way that I show that I need three of that whole group is by putting the NH4 group in parentheses and then outside of the parentheses is where I would put that three. That means I need three of this NH4 group. Um, my nitrogen is not in parentheses, and I only have one, I don't need to write the one. Another example, barium hydroxide. Barium is a plus two. Hydroxide is a minus one. I need one barium, and I'm going to need two of the hydroxide group. For some reason, a lot of people think they don't need parentheses here. I think they think that because hydroxide by itself doesn't have any subscripts, whereas ammonium does. But I need two of the whole group. I need to put the hydroxide in parentheses in order to give it a two. Um, if you aren't giving an additional subscript, 
to the polyatomic ion, then you wouldn't need parentheses. In fact, then it would be weird to do parentheses. Um, let's do potassium hydroxide, or yeah, uh, let's do potassium nitrate, actually. Let's throw some more examples in there. Potassium's a plus one, nitrate's a minus one. So you can crisscross if you want, but know that the same charge are just gonna cancel out. I only need one of each. K, am I still on the frame? I think so. Yeah, KNO3, that's one potassium and one nitrate group. I don't need parentheses. Try those.